Welcome to Upticks with Jake Falcon, founder and CEO of Falcon Wealth Advisors. In this podcast, we help high net worth individuals overcome financial complexities. We do this by enhancing financial literacy and discussing topics in a language free from industry jargon. Join us as we help explain exactly what having a solid financial plan means as Jake draws from years of experience in helping hundreds of individuals get financially organized and focused on their goals. We hope you find Uptick's educational, entertaining, and shareable. Now, on to the show. Welcome back. This is episode 189, April Market Update with Corey Bittner. Corey, welcome back to the show. Jake, thanks for having me. You know, it's been a lot of fun. I've had a variety of guests on. I had a retirement coach. I had a golf blogger. I had a real estate agent. Uh, So it's been a lot of fun this year bringing guests on. And I hope our listeners and our viewers out there are enjoying the content as well. But it's also refreshing to bring you back on to talk about the stock market because uh, that's a big part of what we do for our clients every single day at Falcon Wealth Advisors is manage capital. And I think it's important that we keep our audience informed on not only what's going on in the market, but what we're doing about it. But before we dive into today's topic, Corey, what's new with you? You got any, you know, spring is here, kind of. The sun's up today in Kansas City, but what's new with you? You got anything on the horizon for you and Cassie? You know, not too much. We have, um, no, actually, we, we really don't. In fact, this uh, weekend we, is one of those weekends where we don't have a whole lot planned, which I'm looking forward to, uh, because I know with spring being in the air that everything is going to pick up here pretty soon, but not, not, a t- not too much new to report. Yeah, and same with me. I'm trying to play a little bit more golf. Um, Rachel and I are going to uh, New York here next month, mm-hmm. so that'll be a lot of fun. But um, you're right. I, I've been looking at my calendar, and it's already out of control for like the next several months. So it's going to be go, 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 which, which will be fun. It'll be good. It was nice to kind of relax during the winter and now have things pick up. And so it's like you come out of hibernation during golf season. <laughs> I, I do as a golfer, certainly. So yep. definitely more active in the, uh, you know, spring, summer, fall months than I am in the winter. Uh, but again, thank you all for joining. The best way to make sure you don't miss another episode of Upticks is to subscribe. So if you're watching this on YouTube, Feel free to subscribe. If you're listening to this on your favorite podcast platform, I would suggest you do the same as well. And if you think our content's any good, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. I think that's the way that more people can see it. Corey, quick plug for your show. I know you have your your own show um, that you record. Yes, my podcast and video show on YouTube is In the Money Insight, where, where folks can, of course, subscribe to the podcast wherever they listen. And the Falcon Wealth Advisors Collective on YouTube is where both of the shows live for you and I. That folks word again. That must be a Midwestern like thing. It's not a Texas thing? You know how people in Texas say y'all. <laughs> so it must be folks must be, because I've never, I never use that word. You know what you makes know, me think I don't think, think that of? I've always used it. It's like it's worked its way into my vernacular. It, you know what it thinks me, makes me remind me of? What's that? Uh, Bugs Bunny. That's all folks? Yeah, there you go. There it is. So we'll start calling you bugs. Maybe that's how we can end the show. Like the, uh, you know, the, the end can come across. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> that's all, folks. I just, yeah, I never, used, I never heard somebody use it as much as you use it. Let's talk about the markets. <laughs> okay, good. All right. So year to date, uh, the S&P 500 is still in negative territory. It's had a you know, horrible war has broken out between Russia and Ukraine. Inflation is here. Uh, we've got a looming tax bill, right? Taxes supposedly are going to go up. And we've got a midterm election coming up in the fall. So we've got a lot of uncertainty in the air. I was doing a review yesterday with a client and uh, the S&P 500 was down around 5%. Um, And so Corey, maybe talk about a little bit more just from a pure market perspective, um, why you think, so when a client asks you, why is the market down? What are you telling your clients? Yeah, there is... A number of contributors. You just highlighted a lot of them. <laughs> and I think, Jake, you know, though, our expectation coming into 2022 was that the Federal Reserve, inflation, interest rates, and the election were going to be big themes throughout the year. Uh, and of course, the uh, invasion in Ukraine uh, by Russia has only added to that. But when I'm talking with clients, what I have been, the ongoing conversations we're having, one is talking about what the average pullback in the market looks like on an annual basis. Also understanding that the average well, pullback. What is that? What is the average annual pullback on a market? 
I, it is around 12 or 13 percent. Right. So on average, once a year, the market goes down around 10, 10 plus percent. So again, having pullbacks like we've seen is not nor it's not unnormal, I guess. Go ahead. And I, I also think that the longer, you know, the market kind of drifts higher, like we have since the, you know, the COVID crash two years ago in March of 2020, I also think that the, the longer you go without a 10% correction, a 15% correction, the more, you know, the more painful or the worse it makes it feel for people when that actually comes around. But I also think it's an interesting point to make is that in midterm election years, the average peak to trough decline is not 12 or 13%. It's actually closer to 18 or 19%, which doesn't mean though that the, market ends up being, you know, a, it's a good year or a bad year from start to finish during midterm election years. There's just a wider range and more volatility. Right. And people forget so quickly. It's interesting to me. So, well, I guess they remember kind of the pain and the feeling, but they forget the how things bounce. I mean, in March of 2020, we had a 30% crash in the market in one month, right? So it was down and then it, like you said, it ended the year up. So you have to be careful with that and don't, and luckily most, I haven't had this many conversations and hopefully people out there aren't, aren't panic selling and, and trying to get out of the market because that would be a very foolish um, action on our, you know, from our stance. So good. So the market's down 5%. Now, what I think we've been adding trem tremendous amount of value to our clients' lives is that we, not that we knew there was going to be a, a war with Russia and Ukraine, but we knew inflation was coming. Right. And we knew that the tech stocks had been very overrun and were, in our opinion, overvalued. And so at the beginning of the year, we rotated our individual stock portfolio into more of a defensive pro-inflation allocation, uh, which has actually allowed our portfolio, broadly speaking, again, every client's a little bit different. We don't, we're not managing just a fund here. Every client has, you know, their own stocks and bonds. But from a wealth management perspective, our broadly speaking portfolio has dipped less than that market, which we're very pleased by. And again, to us, that's the reason that we prefer to be stock pickers versus using ETFs, mutual funds, or annuities. When you buy the individual stocks or hire someone like us to buy the individual stocks for you, um, you have potential to have to protect that downside and have a shallower dip when things are going down. So that's been good. I was, I was excited to see that um, play out in our portfolio. And we're continually monitoring that and making adjustments as we deem necessary. So that's a good takeaway, Corey. So again, 10 to 18% correction this year would be historically normal. Um, we've rotated the portfolio to be in a pro-inflation defensive stance. And um, I think most importantly, amongst all that, is you got to remember too, you don't want any money that you're going to need to utilize in the stock market um, th that you're going to need in the next five years. So if, again, if, if you are worried about your stocks going down, you need to revisit your overall portfolio allocation because stocks down today should not impact your financial plan. It's just, and I, I always use this example, and I don't know if it always hits home for people, but it's just like the value of your house, which is probably a bad example, Corey, because houses seem to go up every day, but <laughs> sure. But the value of one's home goes up and down in value every day. You just don't see it. And really, the only time the value of your house matters is when you buy it and when you sell it, right? I mean, that's really the only time that people see what the open market is willing. So, so it's whatever the open market or whatever you were willing to pay for this house. And then when you go to sell it, it's whatever the open market's willing to buy it, buy it from you. And so that's all that matters. The same thing in the stock market. It, if a stock's going up or down, it doesn't matter unless you're trying to buy or sell it. But people get lost in that. I don't, you know, and again, that's part of our job is to provide clarity. It's like, hey, let's, let's, let's open up the hood. You know, do you think XYZ stock's going to go out of business because there's a war going on on the other side of the, of the world? We don't, right? And so we don't, we don't worry about those things. And we certainly don't have any exposure in, in Russia and Ukraine. I feel horrible for what's going on. But, I know. you know, we're not invested in companies that are trading on the Russian stock market. So anyways, did I miss anything on the stock market? Before? I want to talk about bonds also, but go ahead. No, just the one other thing I want to add um, to your point, Jake, is you know, sometimes I feel like we might pound the table when we say this, but it is 
you know, we talk, it seems like we talk about the markets more and more, right? On, on this show, on my show with clients, et cetera. Of course, when things are more volatile, which makes sense. But when we go and invest money for clients in the market, we understand there's going to be periods of volatility and we position the portfolio accordingly. So when these things happen, right, when volatility picks up and the market declines, we're not, you know, running around our office scrambling, trying to figure out what to do, right? The whole idea is we, we understand these things are going to happen. And I, to your point about March of 2020, that was the most volatile month on record ever in the market, which is an interesting point. The average daily move in March of 2020 was 5%, which is huge for A day? the course of an entire month. That was the average daily move. Wow. Yeah, March 16th of 2020, the market was down 13% in one day. So my, since then, we've seen the market roughly double from you know, where it bottomed on March 23rd of 2020. So if we see a 5, 10, 15, even 20% pullback correction after nearly a doubling of the equity markets, that wouldn't be out of the norm. Right, and credit to all of the clients and investors out there that didn't panic sell during March of 2020. I mean, that's, that's a good lesson is that as long as you stayed in the market, and in fact, we actually bought low when the market crashed, we were buying stocks for our clients, many of our clients, um, the market turned around and went back up. And like you said, it's doubled roughly since then. So the whole risk premium that you get paid by investing in stocks is if you have the discipline um, to stay invested during times of uncertainty, that's historically speaking, when stock investors have been rewarded. Now I want to yep. go, I want to talk a little bit about something else too, because I've actually had, these are some real client questions um, that I've had lately. I know I like to do that when you and I uh, do the show together, um, but I've had some real client questions over the last few months about clients wanting to, so we, we run a portfolio of 35 stocks and, and we feel that that achieves diversification, broadly speaking. But every now and then I'll get a, a message from a client wanting to unplug one stock because they don't understand it or they want to add something else because their brother, sister's mother's nephew's cousin said it was going to go up, right? And so um, I just want to explain what, what really goes into portfolio construction. And so when we built out our portfolio, it's not as simple as Corey and I looking at 35 stocks and thinking which ones are going to be good. It's, it's, it's far more intuitive and um, detailed than that. And if, and if our clients remember, we have that colored box chart that many of them have seen. Um, and basically, in each one of those categories, we have to have a certain amount of stocks in order to be properly diversified. So we have to have so many large, so many mid, so many small, so many international, so, many, so much in commodities, so much in real estate, right? So it's like a big jigsaw puzzle that if you just remove a piece, you can't just replace it with some arbitrary different stock because then what you're doing is you're actually messing up the whole portfolio's diversification. And, and so it's very, and so a lot of people will relate it to baking a cake. It's like baking a cake with no flour or with no eggs. It's not gonna probably taste very good, right? Or I love Mexican food. It's like eating a taco with no tortilla. Sure. But it's not a taco. Right. right. So if you start picking apart the portfolio that we have spent hours and hours and hours researching and developing and building, you're just messing up your overall allocation strategy. So you have to be careful. So we don't want to mess up the core. Now, if you want to speculate and add to it because you have some money to lose, right, you know, then that's one sure. thing. But I don't want clients calling in and thinking, well, I want to unplug these three stocks, Jake, because I don't understand them and I don't, I don't know what's going on there because you're actually ending up damaging the overall strategy. And, and the idea is that we're buying stocks when one zigs, we want the other one zagging. So that's what diversification is. So even though one's up and one's down, that's also fine because believe it or not, in a, in a well-defined and construction, constructed portfolio, you don't want everything up at the same time because... Theoretically, that means if everything's down, then you're going to have everything down at the same time. And then you're, you're not doing any, yourself any good. You're really not diversified. It's a little soapboxy, got, Corey, but you have anything to add there? Do you have those? No, I, um, I, I almost have to pat you on the back, Jake. I can't believe I'm saying this because you did a, a great job there with that explanation. The only thing I think I would add to that um, is just like you said, as far as you know, when one thing zigs and one other thing zags, when it comes to asset allocation and it comes to diversification, it's not about how many different 
things you own. It's about how they all behave relative to each other. Because if we own 500 stocks that all behave similarly because of the sectors that they're in or the style that they're in, we're not doing ourselves much good because we're not diversified. Right. When, when, when different assets behave differently at different times and have different risk involved, that's where the actual diversification comes into play. And that's why we ultimately are allocators of capital and our asset allocators for our clients, because we're you know, ultimately committing a percentage of the portfolio to all these different styles, all these different sectors. Um, and I think we've seen this year has been a perfect example of why we do that. There's been a lot of sectors and styles that have really gotten you know, hit hard, much, much harder than you know, the S&P or the NASDAQ or the Dow Jones has looked on the surface. But there's other companies in the portfolio that have done very, very well in spite of what's going on. That is diversification. Right, right. And so as a client, you don't want to start in there and tinkering with things because it's just going to, I will coach you off that ledge, but you don't want to, you don't want to start picking that. Now, what's good about what we do is it is transparent. So a lot of clients have come to us from other advisors and they're in mutual funds. And when they own a mutual fund, you have no idea what you own, right? You just have shares of XYZ mutual fund company, but they're in there buying and selling stocks also. And the investor doesn't get to pick it apart. Probably for better, right? Actually. But probably. Clients, yeah, but for yeah. our clients, we want you to have transparency, but we, we want you to understand that when we're building this portfolio, it's not to be picked apart. It's a cake, right? Or it's a taco or it's a house, right? It's like having a house with no doors. Like you, that, that wouldn't work, right. right? So you want to make sure that you keep it constructed. And then again, if you want to have some satellite positions, we're, I'm, I'm all for that. As long as your financial plan can stomach a loss, a, a zero loss, like I'm okay with that. Um, but again, we want to keep that portfolio intact. Now, speaking thing, of the, though, go ahead. Isn't, isn't a flourless cake a thing now? Yeah, probably. I'm just That's why I put eggs that. in there. There you, you know, go. Eggs I think you have to, have I, I don't know. I'm not a baker, but. Me neither. So. <laughs> can't have a taco without a tortilla though. I'm with you there. Yeah. It's not a taco. So, uh, so I also want to talk, okay. So moving along here, I want to talk about international markets, right? So uh, I was looking at this, um, particular client when we were doing the review and the international market defined as the MSCI index. So basically kind of a global index minus the U S was also down around 5%. Um, and so international is a tough one because a lot of uh, individuals have what's called domestic bias. So if, you know, if I asked you a, a client, maybe we can do this as a quick exercise. So if you, if, if you're watching this or listening to this, um, why don't we pause here and why don't you just th think of three, Stocks, three stocks. And Corey, what are your three? The companies? Yeah, think of three stocks. Okay, I have three in mind. You want me to name the companies? Yeah, what, what are they? Go ahead. Apple, Amazon, Google. Right, right, which are all US-based companies. Now, I kind of messed up this little exercise because um, the domestic bias is that most all people will pick. So if you ask people in Canada, they'll pick stocks in Canada. Yes, people in Asia, they'll pick stocks in Asia. My point is, most people just are comfortable and understand what they know and where they live. And so, but in our opinion, again, through years of study, having an international component can actually help lower the risk and increase the return of a portfolio. And that's what we're trying to achieve for our clients. So even though the international markets are down and we're being very selective, we still want to have international exposure. We just want to be cognizant of what we own and why we own it. So we're certainly still buying international stocks. Um, it makes up around a third or less of our equity portfolio. So definitely more heavily weighted than the US, but it's a huge global economy out there. And you definitely wanna take advantage of opportunities when there's other companies based in other countries that are very profitable and very good and well-run organizations. So, so international's down also, but again, we're just being very selective on which international stocks we pick and hold in the portfolio. Um, we have recently decreased our exposure to China. We felt we were kind of running over a little bit there. So, and we, we had a good run with it. So we've pulled that back a little bit, but that doesn't mean we're not, we're not looking at a, a global, globally diversified portfolio. We're certainly still doing that. You bring up a great point about the domestic bias though, because it's just an obvious example. Um, if we understand what's happened to the markets in Russia this year, you know, people that live in Russia just like people that live in the United States right. are going to have a domestic bias and have the majority of their money invested in companies that they know that are in their country. And we've seen what hap what's happened to the market this year. It's a perfect example. It's unfortunate, but it is. It is a 
perfect example. Right. Right. So again, so you don't want to run away from that again. You want to stay. So just like the U.S. market's down around 5%, so is the international. So, and then the third one I want to talk about is the bond market. The bond market's down around 5%. <laughs> so I thought it was pretty fascinating when I'm looking at the client's review, all three kind of major indexes that we look at and track were all down about the same. Now, the beauty, which I was very proud of for this particular client, their account was down less than all three of them. And again, that's because of the individual holdings and the way we had it diversified we were allowed to make that dip more shallow. Now the bond market being negative is very complicated for a lot of people. And so just to kind of explain this in English, when interest rates go up, which they have, and they will continue to go up, bond prices go down. But the way that we buy bonds, Corey, is that we have maturity dates behind those bonds. And even though the bond may be showing up negative 5% this year, when that bond matures, that will that negative return will actually turn into zero. And in between now and then, you'll earn an interest payment. So again, so instead of like buying and selling a house, you can think of a bond as renting out a house. So get, but renting out a house that you know what you're going to sell it for, which is actually probably even better. So if you buy a house for 300,000, it'd be like negotiating a contract where you're going to sell the house in five years for 300,000. And along the way, you're going to make two or 3% interest. That's what bonds are basically. Now there's risk that the bond could default, right? And it will, and if you need to sell it early, it could be higher or lower in value. Um, but that's what bonds are doing. So we're not really worried about the bond market as far as a, a negative return. Uh, we're more concerned about that income that the bonds that we're buying are generating. Now, now I know Corey, as part of our big restructuring here, you have taken more of an active role in our bond management for all of our clients. So why don't you kind of explain some of the research you've been seeing and maybe talk about what types of bonds we're buying and when, when they mature. Sure. So first I just wanna explain in plain English the best that I can and Jake, feel free to pick this apart. Um, the, the concept of the yield curve when people are buying bonds, you can imagine if, if I went out and bought a bond today that matures in two years and I can earn a little over 2%, if I buy a bond that matures in five years or 10 years or 20 or 30, theoretically, the further that I go out on the, you know, the longer that I'm willing to lock up those dollars, the higher interest rate I should earn. So the idea is in the current environment, when the Fed, Federal Reserve has been lifting interest rates, they only control the very, very short term rates, the, the overnight Fed funds rate. They don't control the yield on the 10 year treasury bond, as an example, the open market does and dictates that. So what we do, and what we look at for clients when we're buying bonds is we are mindful of where interest rates are at today, what expectations are for future rates, and then uh, you know duration risk, maturity, interest rate risk, et cetera. So what we have done in the midst of rising interest rates is we've shortened the maturity of the bonds that we're buying. So we've talked about the latter on here before. If somebody has $500,000 going into bonds, you might buy $50,000 worth of a bond that matures in one year, two years, three years, all the way out 10 years. For As an example, what we've done in the midst of rising rates is we've shortened that ladder. And now when we're buying bonds for clients, half of the bond portfolio is going into bonds that are maturing in two years or less. And the other half is going into investment grade corporate bonds that are maturing in three to five years. Yeah. So that's smart, right? So the idea is we don't want to lock in a bond for 10 years that's only paying maybe 3% interest when we know inflation is here and the Fed is raising rates. So when the Fed raises rates on that short end of the ladder, it should ripple over and all of the rates, that's what you're talking about, the yield curve going up, should go up with it. It doesn't always happen that way, but it, it, it should. And so we want to have that money maturing in the next one to five years so that when rates are higher, hopefully, we will reinvest that cash in new bonds that are paying hopefully five, six, seven percent. Yep. So we're being very tactical on that bond portfolio, and we won't hesitate to actually buy or sell bonds within that. So the good news is that because we're fiduciaries, there's no commission generated when we buy or sell a bond. So if we need to go swap you out of a bond or one matures and we need to reinvest, the clients aren't paying anything extra. We're, we're managing that just like we manage the stocks in the, in the same manner. So it's all part of the, the big cake or taco or house, right? Mm -hmm. So the bonds are a very important component. And the bonds we want 
for that short-term money anyways. We want you to have bonds for five years or less, right? So we want to make sure that you've got plenty of money in there to sustain your cash flow. So you're not worried about this crazy stock market going up and down that, you, that you've got money to go on vacation or to buy a new car, right? Or to buy another home, right? So you, so we want to make sure that that, that bond portfolio is managed, um, is definitely relatively safer than the stock market. Um, and, you know, we're smart about where the interest rate environment is and we take advantage of what the current rates are paying. Good one, Corey. Yeah, and, and thank you for taking an increased, um, basically shedding some light on our bond portfolio. So again, Corey's been picking up the research on that and, and going to help us be a little bit more active because frankly, it's been 40 years since we've seen inflation at this number. So bonds need to be managed differently. It's a different environment than, than it's been for decades. And so it, it requires a little bit more oversight. And that's exactly what our clients are hired, hired us to do at Falcon Wealth Advisors is to manage that for them. And that's what we're doing. For what it's worth, Jake, I will be interested to see how it all plays out because for my entire professional career that we've worked together, um, I have been preparing for higher interest rates uh, because I've been told that interest rates have nowhere to go but up and that's not what happened. Um, I think the, big, the, the, you know, the most meaningful difference this time is that inflation is here. Um, and for that particular reason, you know, the Federal Reserve might be more motivated to uh, combat that by raising rates more than they have in the past. But we'll see. Just, you know, again, 40 years, we've seen rates drift down. And along the way, people have routinely assumed that they're going to start moving higher. And they've done the opposite of that. Right, right. Good. So, so that's our April market update. So again, markets down in the U.S., in the international, and the bonds. Hopefully your portfolio is down less. And if you're a client of Falcon Wealth Advisors, we can pull that up and show it to you in our reviews. Um, the big takeaway is stay disciplined. This too shall pass. Um, yeah. You know, I think what you own is very important during these types of environments. So it's very important. And you also don't want to pick apart things and start moving things around because you're just going to mess it all up. Um, so stay disciplined, stay invested, revisit your financial plan, and uh, we'll continue to, to dish out these market updates as things progress. Anything else, Corey? Nope. So you had no plans this weekend? Not really. No. Yeah. We're, I'm going to go pick up a... Um, we had a, a friend of mine that, that has a local woodworking business. Um, they made a shelf, a floating shelf. You know what a floating shelf is, Jake? I just learned. I think so. It's, that's where it just basically sits on the wall? Yep. Yeah, I you need know exactly some of those. what it is. I need some yep. of those. Well, I'm going to go pick up the one that they uh, made this weekend, and then I'm going to figure out if I can figure out how to hang it up. <laughs> well, send me a send me a picture, Corey, because if they if, if uh, Rachel and I have been wanting some floating shelves, believe it or not. Okay. So cool. Yep. I think that's the I think that's the only thing that's on the agenda. Got it. Got it. I've got a um, tonight. I've got a retirement party uh, mm. for one of my long standing clients. I'm very excited for him. He, uh, retired after many. Many, many years in a successful career. So that'll be fun. It's his birthday also. What a great, what a great thing. You have a retirement party on your birthday party. Um, and I might squeeze in around a golf. I don't know. We'll see uh, if the weather holds up here. It's finally sunny in Kansas City. So maybe I'll, uh, I'll get around a golf in, but we'll see how that goes. Excellent. So, well, thank you all again. I know we got we to gotta wrap it up. So thank you all for tuning in. Um, and we hope you have a great week. Thank you for listening to Upticks. Click the subscribe button to be notified when new episodes become available. Also, be sure to visit our website, falconwealthadvisors.com, and click the Contact Us button if you'd like to meet with Jake and his team.